Thanks, everyone, for showing up um, for a crazy taste of Haskell. Um, I'm Mark, M0, blah, blah. Uh, so Haskell is scary. You've all heard it. You've all heard the rants on Reddit, right? You know, it's got no state. Um, you know, who wants laziness? Laziness is, it's lazy, you know, and PHP has, you know, combinatorics, screw that. Um, and after all, didn't we just spend the last 20 years, like, making dynamic languages rule the world? I mean, we did, didn't we? Right? And monads! Um, okay, but Haskell is actually really scary cool. Um, it is functional, which turns out to be kind of scary and cool, and it's lazy, and it has high order functions and type inference, and shh, it has monads. Okay. This is why I got hooked into, into uh, Haskell. Um, I've actually been programming for more than half the time the profession has even existed. And so three years ago when I ran into Haskell or sort of looked at Haskell again, I was shocked and really enjoyed that, like, my god, there was like something new to learn about programming. I mean, something really new. So that was fun. Um, it really does twist your mind. I mean, you know, Haskell is really makes you really rethink a lot of stuff. Um, but the two things that I think that really got me is, look, the language is beautiful. You write code, and you just look at it, and you're like, wow, those are like the nicest seven lines of code I've written in the last month. Like, they're just gorgeous, you know? And so it, it's really beautiful code. So because of that reason, a lot of code to show you. I have uh, 50 more slides, and every one of them, I think, has code on it. <laughs> um, so we're going to go really fast, but you're all Googlers, so it'll be no problem. Um, cool. Mute. We need a mute on some VC, hopefully, some site. Oh, yes. No. Mute, mute, mute. Ah. Don't know who it is. All right. Uh, the code is going to look like crazy moon language. It's just insane. You know, it's just totally different. Well, not really, but it is different. So just be brave. Okay. Just be brave. <laughs> All right. Um, there is a Git repo if you want to pull everything, although, of course, I edited the slides 15 minutes before we started, so it's not quite up to date. Um, you can just Google for Haskell Amuse Bush, and the first hit is this repo. Um, and I haven't pushed yet to get the latest stuff, um, so it's a little bit out of date from the slides. Um, but it has not only the slides, it has all the source code that I'm going to show you in Haskell files that you can load up in uh, the REPL and edit, so you can play along as well, if you want. But I'm not going to give you too much time. So let's start with something really, really familiar. Um, this is Bash, not Haskell, um, right? And this stuff should look pretty familiar to anyone. Uh, there we go, a little bigger. Um, right? This is just standard pipelines on the shell. Okay, what do they all do? They all take input, they process it, they produce output as soon as they are able. That's actually a feature of most most Unix commands. Most of those commands do not modify any state. Actually, I chose ones which didn't modify any state at all. Right? But those are useful things you do. Right? In short, those are functional, pure, and lazy. Right? So you're actually used to this stuff. It's actually not as crazy and weird um, as you think. And you know, the bash shell or the shell and the concept of the shell has been around for how many decades now, and we still all use it. So it might have some value there. Okay, let's rewrite that in Haskell. Um, hopefully that's big enough for you to read. Um, so there's some gobbledygook on the first line, which we're going to ignore for this millisecond. There's a next line we're going to talk about a lot, and if you stick that in a file called run has in, uh, part one.hs and run it, you give it this poem as input, and surprise, it sorts the lines and gives you that at pro poem as output. Uh, Zen master basho haiku, for those who want the reference. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the actual processing. Right, which is right on that first line. It is not exactly rocket science. We're going to define a, a function called process, which takes some T, some text, and it's going to call some functions. And the only difference from what you're used to is that functional arguments don't go in parentheses. We just use parentheses for grouping. So be brave. Just look at the code. Get the lines of T, means take this string and turn it into an array of strings, or a list of strings, technically a list. Sort that list, and then unlines, which is another library function, which takes a list of strings, slams new lines into them, and throws it all together. All right? So the first line should be like dead clear, right? I see anyone looking strained? You can like okay, everyone's nodding yes. So good. Okay, now I know I have to take you back to high school, and everyone hates that. But in high school, you algebra, 
well, Chris, you know, you learned this, right? F of G of X can be written as this funky thing with a dot in the middle, right? Right, which is function composition, F of G of X, right? So you can see that. Well, in Haskell, it turns out that's actually a programming language feature. So in the same way, we can do that up here. We can factor, we can sort of rewrite this this way, right? So the function process of some text T is applied to that text T, the function lines composed with sort composed with unlines, right? So that dot operator is exactly like it was in algebra. All it just means is apply the thing on the left to the result of having applied the thing on the right. So unlines it, then sort it, I mean lines it, then sort it, then unlines it, right? It reads kind of right to left, which you might seem kind of strange to you because bash, things go in the other direction. But look up here, right? I mean, it's just getting rid of all these parentheses. Okay, now, here comes the real brevity. We can actually do algebraic simplification, or it's sort of the equivalent. So work with me here. If process of takes some input, right? Process is a function applied to some input t, and all it is is this composite function, these three things applied in sequence to t. In Haskell, we can get rid of the t's. Because we can say, well, process, by the way, the tick marks are just valid characters for identifiers, and I had to name them all three different things so they can go in the same file. Process double tick mark is a function that is just the composition of these three functions. Have I lost anyone yet? Good. Onward. Okay, so we can code a bunch of other ones. We can say sorting lines is unlines dot sort lines, right? Compose those three. We can reverse lines. We can Take the first two lines, because take two is a, well, it does what you think, right? So anyone see a pattern? It's a pattern. It's algebra. We can factor it. So we can actually write a function called by lines, which takes a function f, and it's equal to, we just write the same expression, but stick our variable in the middle, right? So by lines of f is the same as having written unlines.f.lines. So now I can rewrite those three functions. Sort lines, right, by lines, sort. Reverse lines, by lines, reverse. First two lines, by lines, take two. Yes, yes, no, yeah, yeah, okay, getting yeses, good. All right, let's write our own. Okay, I'm gonna write a new function sort of from scratch here, it's called indent. Um, this funny line at the top is a type declaration. It says indent is a function that starts with a string, takes a string argument, and turns it into a string, has a string result. It's kind of very functional style notation, oddly enough. All right? Um, anyone notice that this is the first type I have shown you anywhere? All the other code is completely 100% valid Haskell. You'll find it in the in the files that are with the repo um, exactly as I wrote it here, with no additional typing. So Haskell is a language that is really strongly typed, and yet we didn't have to type any types. That's because Haskell is type inferencing, which means that when you type something, when you write line of code, the expression, Haskell figures out what type that must be. When you write a type to the first order of approximation, 98% of the time, the type is for you, not for the compiler. In fact, the compiler ignores what you write as a type, figures out what the type is on its own, and then says, ha, did he get it right? <laughs> Uh, now you might think that's kind of crazy, like aren't like shouldn't we? Yeah. But no, the compiler it's there because we write the types as communication between programmers and a communication of our intent, and the compiler is actually checking us, checking to make sure we're honest. Okay, so indent is a function from string to string. It's really complicated. It takes an argument s and it appends that's the double plus operator a bunch of spaces to the front. Great. So we should be able to follow our pattern. All right, byline sort, bylines reverse, and say bylines indent. Anyone want to guess? Boom, it doesn't work. And the worst problem is if you put this into GHSI, you'll see this horrible thing down there. Um, that is the Haskell compiler's idea of poetry. Um, it's writing you kind of a love poem, but it's from a compiler. Um, and so as a consequence, we ignore it. <laughs> to the degree that this is just crazy moon poetry and you just have to deal with the fact that it's there. And most of the time you just figure out what line number it is and go look again. Okay, what is the problem? The problem is all our other functions, sort and reverse, took a list of lines and did something to them. But we wrote something which takes a string. 
Okay, so we're going to use something called map, map to the rescue. Now, you've probably all at this day and age programmed in a language that has a collections library, and that collections library has either a for each or a map function. Right? And usually map takes a functional argument, a function pointer, or depends on the language you're working in, and iterates through the collection, applying the function and gathering up all the results and returning you a new collection. This is nothing new. Map exists, and you've, I'm certain everyone here has been exposed to a map function. And just to make sure we realize what we're talking about, um, I gave you some examples. Compare, if we map reverse over this list of strings, right, it reverses each individual string versus mapping reverse to the list of strings, which map reverses the list itself. Got it? Right. Same thing as like sorting. Um, um, some of you might at this point be scratching your nose and go, wait, does reverse work on a list of strings or does reverse work on a string? Um, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> does both. OK. So to indent each line of our poem, right, I have to do something by lines, but I better map. Right, by lines expects a function over a list. So I'm going to map indent over that list. By lines, map indent. I could also factor that whole pattern out because we had a thing called by lines. How about each line? Given a function, now I've written a, now I've written a, a type. Given a function from a string to a string, notice the parentheses, and a string, return a new string. So let's look at what that's going to happen. Each line f, it's going to take this, <clears throat> it's going to take a string, apply lines to it, give us a list of lines, map our function f over each individual line, and then unlines the result back together into one big string to return. So each line is now a useful utility function which does something, applies something to each individual line. Yes? Uh, no. It is not. So the question was, and when you write map space indent, is that the same as indent dot map? No, it is not. We are passing indent as a function, as an argument to map. Okay, map, is a map is a function. Right. There's no period or object. There's no uh, receiver in this language. It is not object oriented. So map is just a pure function at the top there. Um, but we're gonna. You're getting close to a problem. Anyway. Uh, close to an interesting thing. So indent line, we can do it this way, or we can use this combinator, this thing we just built called each line, each line indent. And it, if you run them either, you get indeed an indented poem. It's very exciting. Um, but um, wait, where is the second argument to map? I told you back here, map takes a function and a list and returns a list. In fact, at this point, looking at that top line should hopefully be kind of clear that that's what that says. It takes, right, starts with, takes a function from A to B, a list of A's, and gives you a list of B's. But in this code up here, there's no second argument to map. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> right? Of course, it's not there. Because map of F, so look at map this way. We can say map takes a function from A to B, and because of associativity, just trust me, I can parenthesize the remainder. So you can think of map as taking a function from A to B and turning it into a function from list of A to list of B. Not that. If I just apply map to the first argument, I get back a new function. It's called currying. Mm -hmm. It's curried. And I get back a new function, a function from list of A to B. So it turns our indent, which only works on a string, to a version of indent which works on a list of strings. We call this lifting. We're lifting up. Map is kind of bringing our simple function up into the world of, of lists. And that's what's going on. All right, I'm going to write some more code here, quickly. We want to yell um, um, because we like yelling, right? So this is another function from string to string. And so I'm going to yell, and I'm going to map this function called to upper, it's from the library, yes, it uppercases characters. I'm going to map that over the string and append a bunch of exclamations. And I'm going to write yell each line. I'm going to use our each line function to apply this to each line of the poem. And indeed, what happens? I've yelled each line of the poem. Not particularly exciting. It's pretty much what we did before. But what if I want to yell each word? 
Well, we're very, very lucky. There's actually like lines and unlines. The library has words and unwords. So we can define equivalently a function called each word that given a function will apply it to each word of a string. So, right, we call words, which breaks it up into a list of words. We map F, in this case, yell over that list of words. And when we unwords, put it all back together. And when we go off and do this, crap, it all comes out on one line. Right? Because it broke all the words apart, and all the words got slammed together with spaces, and we lost all the lines. So what do we really want to do? We want to yell by words, by lines. <laughs> well, guess what? <laughs> we can actually write yet another helper function, each word on each line. Right? Given a function f, this will apply to each word on each line by wrapping our function in each word, and then calling each word on our function, and then calling each line on that. And indeed, if I apply that, I get this. right? And I've managed to preserve the lines and do it to every single word. Notice that I have used the very functions we have defined ourselves as functions to more functions we've defined ourselves. right? So what bus did we just get hit by? This is the power of higher order functions. right? You can very quickly build yourself up a library for doing higher level manipulations of things, and then reuse it very, very, very quickly. <sighs> Onward. OK, so we've talked a lot about functions. What about data? Got to have data in a program somewhere. Um, so of course, if we're going to talk about structured data, we might as well talk about lists. And so one could choose to define lists like this. This is actually a user-defined type. This is not the built-in list. It's just a list. Um, if you come from a certain persuasion, you might choose to call that nil and cons instead of end of list and link. But let's just read this. When you have a piece of data of type, li yes? Either. <laughs> Good question. Um, so yes, I actually wrote the alphas because I just wanted to flex that Haskell is actually defined in terms of Unicode. Woohoo! And so you welcome to use Greek variable names if you wish. Um, <laughs> um, actually, in fact, you're probably not unlikely to see this. Um, uh, most people do, in fact, use uh, Latin letters in this particular context. Um, so uh, that is actually a type variable. Whoa type variable. Um, <laughs> so this is so when you have a list of some type, either, note the or sign there, either it's just the end of the list, the empty list, or it is a link of the list with some value of whatever the hell alpha ends up being, and then recursively another datum of type list alpha. Right? This is just standard kind of recursive definition of a list. Okay, so we can all play around with some obvious types, right? The, we can define the value empty equals the end of the list. Notice that we can kind of use these user-defined options. We call them constructors. Uh, um, don't think constructor like C++ or Java. Um, empty is end of list. One word is a link of the string apple and the end of the list. Right, So that's a one word list. Two words is a link banana. And then in parentheses, I create another link of cantaloupe of end of list. Right, Kind of sort of should be sort of straightforward. Be brave. Just go for it. All right, pop quiz. If we've given those three things I just typed, what do you think happens with the bottom one of the first mysteries? So anyone guess, what is mystery number one? It is a list of a pair. It's one thing, right? So the first thing this is showing you is that, right? remember, there's no modification of state in Haskell. So when I declared empty equal to end of list, I can use it just as well anywhere else. You might think that's annoying because like, you can't modify state. But it's actually really nice because things factor really well. Like the guy who wrote mystery.1 is like, Whew, this is a single element list. I'm certain of it. <laughs> you know, um, It isn't going to change out from underneath me. Mystery2, well, you can compose these things. Link, the string peach, and then what? And then some other list, right? Some other item. It has to be another list datum. So mystery2 is a two-word list, right? Peach, apple. Mystery three, anyone want to guess what mystery three is? Who wants to be brave? What? Lots of pineapples. Right, it's an infinite list of pineapples. Haskell's perfectly happy with this. Completely happy. Like, you type that in, Haskell's like, sure, no problem. <laughs> Works fine. Um, anyone want to guess what mystery four is? Yeah, it's a type error, right? Because something that's odd here is that lists are, right? We said it was a list of some type. And all these other ones have been a list of string. This first link has an integer. 
But the Senka link has a string. And if you looked at the definition, you'll notice that it had the same alpha in both places. Yeah? Of, what is the context of mystery query? These are typed at the top level. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so your your uh, names are in all the top-level same. It's a re, it's a um, mutually recursive set of definitions. Yeah. So you can refer to yourself. And the reason that this doesn't go off into infinity at this moment is it's lazy. <laughs> right. So no one's asked for what happens after the first link of that list. So we haven't bothered to go look there. And the fact that we will eventually go look one step further is fine. Um, Okay, so yes, number four is a type error. Okay, let's write some quick functions on lists. Oh, good, I'm doing great on time. All right, here's some examples of how you write functions. Notice list back here has two different kinds. A datum of type list can have one of two forms. It can be the end of the list, that's one form, or it can be a link, that's the other form. So strangely enough, it is common that all our functions on lists will have two clauses. Yes? What do you mean by the type error? Yes. Not have any kind of or no. Not of the type you are used to. There are strange, weird, wonderful, odd things which you will be tempted to use in your first weeks of Haskell, you know, that let you do this. Oh, I really, really, really need a you know heterogeneous type. Um, and and then when you've used Haskell for six months, you're like, I was so foolish. I never needed that heterogeneous type ever. <laughs> so this is one of those you got to be brave and like trust that this sounds crazy that you can't do this, but in fact you really won't actually need it. <laughs> There are other ways to achieve what you're trying to achieve, which are actually more powerful and, more importantly, safer. Um, okay. So, some functions. Because list has two forms, a datum of type list has two forms, almost all functions on it will have two clauses. Notice I have two equations for drop one. So we can read this pretty straightforward. Drop one takes a list of some type, I don't know what type it is, and returns me a list of the same type. If it has the form link first rest, first rest with pattern matched variables. They're just variables for what we'd be matching in those positions. Then it's just the rest of the list, having dropped the first link. And what if drop one gets a list of type form end of list? What should it do? Well, I don't know. We'll decide that dropping one element off an empty list is just an empty list. That seems like a nice, safe thing to do. All right, we'll write end of list. Um, and we want to guess what happens if you leave off that second equation? Compiler's like, Dude, you forgot one. <laughs> You're missing out, right? So one aspect about Haskell um, is that it's pretty easy to make sure that you caught all the cases, right? And it catches that before you actually attempt to use that. It catches it at compile time. Yeah, at compile time, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you missed one. Like, if you really want to miss one, go turn off this warning here. But like, we really don't suggest you miss one. Why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to miss one? You don't want to miss one because, right? If you have all the cases covered, then you're certain the function always has a well-defined value. In fact, this is kind of something subtle takes a while to get used to. If you have all the cases covered, then you're certain your function never crashes. And I mean never in a much more serious sense than the never that you're used to. I mean, it never crashes. It can't. Like, it has a well-defined value. Right? If you covered all the cases and the compiler doesn't complain, right? then the only possible problem that the function could have, I mean, it might not implement what you're trying to do, right? It might have a different function than your compute a different result, right? The only thing it can really do is go off into, inf you know, go off, you know, diverge, go off an infinite computation. That's the only real error that you could have left, which is kind of fun. Okay, here's another function called just one. It's a little weird. It takes a list. It returns a list. Um, if the list is just a link, then we return a list of just that first item, right? And what do we do if there's nothing in the list? What should just one return? I don't know. It's got to return something. Or I get that compiler warning, which yells at me. So I'll have it return an empty list. OK. Seems kind of weird, but there's a function definition. OK. A little bit back to reality. Actually, Haskellers, you know, lists are really common, and we don't like to type so much. And so this is from the standard library. I want to point out a little bit something amazing here. The syntax of the square brackets is actually built into the language, but the type list isn't. This is actually defined in a library file whose source code on your installation you can actually go find and look and inspect. 
In fact, you can copy it into your own modules and create your own version, um, which is kind of astonishing, right? I mean, it's actually built in the language. There's nothing magical about how this works. So here's everything I just wrote, but written with this new notation. Notice um, end of list is written at this funny empty square, you know, double square brackets. And link is written by an infix operator called colon. Right? So colon puts an item, the A, onto, and this is kind of a funny list of A. Don't worry about it too much. The, the, the syntax of list looks pretty much like what you expect. In fact, it's so much like what you expect. What I just wrote is Haskellers don't even type that much. I'm going to flip back and forth a little quickly between these two. The, whoops. Stop that. There we go. The only real difference is on these lines, people like to write lists this way because they don't like to write the silly colon. Look at the colon, right? The string apple colon linked onto the empty list. They don't like to write that. You like to write apple um, you know, inside the square brackets. It's purely syntactic sugar. That's all. And these are all the same functions. And so much for that. OK, two more standard things. Then we're going to get to some code, more code. OK, a string is just a list of characters. Really. There it is. And then there's this funny other type, a datum of type maybe. It has two clauses too, just like list had two clauses, but it's even simpler than list. Maybe is either a datum of type maybe some type is either nothing or just a single value. Seems kind of a crazy little minor thing to write. This is how you'd use it. Like maybe if this function takes pick message gets maybe an integer, Right? It has to have two clauses because there's two forms. Right? So we pick message. If it's just an n, then I'm going to construct this string. Pick a number like n. You know, show is how you turn a value into a string. You know, display it. And if pick message, if the value is nothing, I'm going to say a different message. So that's how you use it. Just pattern matching just like we did with lists. So. We had this awkward function called just one, right? Remember I said like, ah, oh, what if the list is empty? What should I do? Like, what should I return? And it's really awkward because I want the first thing on the list, but just one gives me the first thing on the list, but damn, it's inside another frickin' list, right? It's kind of annoying, right? So you might be tempted to write the bad function at the bottom, in which case you would be bad. Because look at it. It says, if the list is... Here's some cool notation stuff. We like to we don't like to type a lot as Haskellers. Right? If the list consists of a value a and the underbar is eh, whatever. I don't care. It's a variable that matches but doesn't no one uses it. Then it's just a, just the first thing on the list. But if it's the empty list, well I can't like what a would I return? I mean if a is integer, should I return zero? I don't know, maybe zero is a useful value. I mean, what are you gonna return? Well it turns out there's like nothing you can return in this case, and so you write Error, and error is this magical built-in function, <laughs> um, which which like kills your program and crashes it with a message. Uh, actually, it does if you end up trying to use it. But so you you don't want to use an error; it's a bad thing. Um, so that's a very bad thing to have happen. So that this one like shuts the compiler up, but you end up inducing an error into your program. So here's a better way. So let's use maybe because the answer is this function maybe has an answer. Maybe it doesn't. Right? And so this is a much more clean way to write this. Right? The first one of a list is maybe it's something. We either have just or nothing. OK. <clears throat> Keep your eye on the code very carefully. Here is a real function that finds the first character after a star. So given a string, maybe it's going to return a character. Maybe char. Notice we're getting rid of nulls. There's like no null in this language. Right? Find after star. Well, if I have a list of a character and another character and then the rest of the list, then if that character equals a star, let's return just D, because we found it. We have a character after a star. Else, let's just recurse. Find after a star. We'll put D in front of the rest of the list and call it on that list. Let's have another clause. If all else fails, underbar, I've, this is a catch-all, catches everything, then nothing. There is nothing after a star. Got it? Anyone confused on how that code works? No. Uh, yes? Yes, so the question is, are the pattern matching semantics in order? 
And the answer is yes, they write, they trust in the order that you write them. None of this funny reordering or any of that stuff. It's like exactly, just read it in order. That's how it tests it. Makes it easy. So just is right back here. There's this type called maybe. It's a data of type might. Right? So maybe has two forms. If you have a datum of like maybe an integer, either you have a nothing or you have just an integer. So it has two forms, just like the list had two forms, a nil and a cons, or a end of list and a link. So there's two forms. So we can return either kind. Right here, we could return two things. Now, in this case, you might be asking, I'm not sure if this is a question you're asking, is just acting like a function in this case? It's actually like a constructor. We're building a value of type maybe. So this function is going to return a datum that has either two forms, just a character, or it's going to be nothing. Java, no. constructors all have the same name as the type. Yes. In Haskell, you give it new names for each form. Yes, right. Every form has to have a unique name, right? And that's how we distinguish them and tell them apart, right? And in, in essence, you don't, in, in other language, the concept of constructor is, you know, you have constructors are just different ways of building up, you know, an instance of, of that t class. But, you know, then you just have an instance of that class and they're all the same. This is sort of the other way around, right? When you build up an instance of maybe by using no, the nothing constructor, it is different in structure than the version that has just a value. It actually has a different internal structure. So, if, I assume that just is just for interpreting No, no, this is user defined. It's not, it actually, is, I mean, it's in the library, it's standard, but this is just built out of the language. Okay, then why do we need just at all? Why not just nothing for? Ah, because you always need a. V Tab, we, they're tags in the front that identify, think of it as a discriminated union. This is like a union of different structs, and you need to have a tag in the front so you can tell which one you've got. And you use that tag both when you build it, and you use that tag when you tear it apart. When do we tear it apart? Pick message here is tearing it apart. It is looking at the union and saying, huh, is this value of maybe have a just tag on it? Oh, then of course it's got a value A that follows the just tag. Right, and the bottom one says, oh, does this value of maybe have just a nothing tag on it? Well, of course, it doesn't have anything else with nothing. All it's got is nothing. Not a. Okay. So here's the version that does string, just at find after star. I'm going to change it to find after char. We're going to make it a little more generic. I'm going to give it a argument. It takes another argument, a character up front, M, the match. And so all I did is instead of saying C double equals, all right, so I gave an extra argument M, you can see it up here, do, 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 there it is, right? You can see that it does now compares against M instead of against the fixed character star. I change the type signature, takes a character and a string and returns maybe a character. So it finds after this character. I had to add another thing here for nothing, but otherwise the code is basically the same. Oh, and when I recalled recursively, I had to pass M again. Okay, I'm going to make this once more generic. So th this, this, this function, I made it a little more generic by checking for any character. Let's make this a template and make it work for any type, not just strings. Ready? One, two, three, go. Anyone notice the only thing that changed? Okay, the name of the function, find after elem instead of find after char. The only thing that changed here is the type declaration. That's it. Now, I did add this very funny, weird piece of cryptic nonsense. Be brave. Just, you know, trust me, it's good. All it says is that A is a type that knows how to do equality. That's all it's saying. But instead of going from char to string, remember string is just a list of char, to maybe char, I just made this generic. Go from some type A and a list of A's and maybe A. Notice that the code is the same. <laughs> the actual body of the code is identical. Yes? So uh, is the type line necessary? Ah, boy, you're like the, you know, like straight man from the question. Yeah, so Mark, what is the deal here? Like, what, well, like, like, what is the type line? The answer is, when we wrote this, the compiler compiled the bottom code and went, wow, this is a nice, cool, generic function. It finds any element after any other element in a given list. Oh, man, he wrote this restrictive type signature. Oh, well, whatever, fine. I'll only let him use it in context of cars and strings. When I wrote this, the compiler did the same thing. It read, looked at the exact same code, came to the same exact conclusion, and said, huh, 
His type line is right. That's exactly right. That's the type of that code. This code is, this code will work if and only if A is a type that understands equality. It figured that out because I used the variable here. And it figured out that indeed there better be a list because I used the list constructor here. And it figured out that the result better be dot maybe because I used just and nothing. It figured all that out automatically. Um, that's all it takes to make your code generic. It is really common when writing Haskell to suddenly realize that the thing you just wrote for some particular case is actually completely generic and you just fix the typeline and go on. So you, when you define a string as an array of char, you also... List of char. Uh, oh, right. Sorry. Uh, you also manually specify the maybe and the just and the nothing types in terms of that. No, no, no. no. You, do that you don't have to actually ever write that. That's all inferred. Maybe was written... So when we wrote maybe... Right, so the issue is like, well, okay, so what happened, like, there's maybe int and maybe char, but I just wrote this thing called maybe a. No, that a didn't mean, oh, yeah, when you get around to it, like, type a version with replacing a. That really is a type variable. <laughs> so you write that line, and maybe is now defined for every type, past, present, and future. And it's already in the library. Okay. <sighs> Onward. Now, maybe actually is really important. Maybe is so important that maybe is actually the thing that blew my mind. This silly, little, teeny, tiny, itsy-bitsy type. This was like the first thing that, like, after my first two weeks back in Ask, I was like, oh! Okay. This thing is really useful. Okay? These functions, I just wrote their type signatures, and you don't have to really pay too much attention to them, because just look at the names. These are all functions you've used in libraries all the time. Find the index of an element. Look up something in a map, right? Strip this prefix from this string, you know. Get the port out of a uh, URI. Anyone ever written that one? Okay, these are all functions which may not have an answer. And in almost every language and in every library I have ever seen, gee whiz, we write conventions like, if the element is not in the list, return negative one. Anyone ever been bitten by that? Ever? <laughs> right? That is a sucky design. Like, that's just bad. Look how easy it is when you have maybe. Because you, you can declare precisely. And so here is the first aha about types in Haskell. Types in C and C++, as we know, are for the compiler to make sure it lays it out in memory correctly. I mean, at least initially. Types in Haskell are for you to communicate with other programmers what you mean in a really deep sense, in a sense I think that is deeper than others. Right? So these are all examples of functions where maybe is far better than returning null. <laughs> did null mean it wasn't there or did null mean it was an error? I mean, what, what is that null? Like, I don't know what that null means. Is the empty string an error? Or did stripping the prefix from the string return me the empty string because it was only the prefix? Or did empty, right, you all see the errors here, right? Okay. So let's look how you use this. So it turns out there's other fun stuff about maybe, because once you have something of this concept into the language, or that you can build in language, you can now start building better utilities for using it, right? So for example, right, here's a function called add a week, day comes from a library, right? So we add days seven to some day object and we get, you know, one week later. And imagine I've got some list of interesting dates, and we're going to use our first one function, which given a list returns maybe one, right? Because if the list is empty, then you get nothing. So I want to find, right, one week later from that interesting date. I can't apply add a week to an interesting date. Everyone see why I can't apply it directly, right? Add a week takes a day, but interesting date has maybe a day. Right? Because there might be a nothing. So how do you do that? Now, in most other languages, what we would probably do at this point in our code is we would write an if statement. Right? If date equals null, then do this. Else, right. Okay. And we would probably propagate that null further up the line. If date equals null, return null. Else, add 7 to the date. Okay. Here we use fmap. What is fmap? Well, you know what map is, right? Map took a function. Like, for example, add a week, and map would apply it to a list of days, adding a week to every single one. If map, let's just take a function of days and apply it to a maybe day. And F map says, well, if we just have a day, then we'll apply it to the inner value. 
and return just that. And if we have a nothing, we'll just return a nothing. We'll propagate the nothing. FMAP does exactly what we want. So, <clears throat> furthermore, if you want to think about this like a, sorry, have I lost anyone? How FMAP, what FMAP does. FMAP takes a function from A to B, from A to A, actually from A to B, but we'll ignore that. In this case, it takes the add a week function, which goes from day to day, and allows us to apply that function inside to the value inside a maybe. If there's a just in there, we'll apply it. If there isn't, no, not. Of course, we think of, yeah? Well, it's in the library, but it is user defined, yes. Ah, how, he says, how does it know how to apply to the real value not? So here's an even bigger sort of, uh, here's a uh, ass assignment for a true head explosion. How that is done is not built into the language either. That's in the library as well. <laughs> so you can go find how FMAP is implemented, and you're like, oh my god, it can do that. That's cool. Um, well, a little outside the talk, but. The person who defined the maybe had to define the way in which it's that, that, is, that is true, it's right. Not <laughs> it's not magic. actually had to write that. Code. Yes, there is writing code for that. Although, yes. So, <clears throat> all right, so fmap, in the same way that I said you could think of map as taking a function from A to B and turning it into a function from list of A to list of B, we can think of fmap, at least in this context, as taking a function from A to B, or in this case, day to day, and turning it into a function from maybe day to maybe day. fmap is lifting your function up into this other environment. OK, and so you can do a week later. Now, the cool thing about this stuff is that all this stuff is in the library, and you can build things which end up being really powerful. Here's, a, here's an operator. It's got a funny spelling, greater than vertical bar, less, uh, less than greater than uh, vertical bar, less than, whatever. Um, you can define your own operators out of symbols in Haskell ad nauseum. People sometimes do. Um, this function, don't pay too much attention to it, does exactly what you think it does. It is short circuit evaluation on, based on maybe. It runs the first function, favorite show, which returns maybe a string if the person has a favorite show. Um, or it returns show with name, right? And it does show with year. So it takes, all right, or takes two maybes. And if the first one is just a value, it returns that. If it's nothing, then it returns the second one. It's short circuit choice. The cool thing about this is, this is not, right, now, we all work in languages with the short circuit choice, but they're generally built in, and you cannot build user operators that do the same thing, or user functions that do the same thing, unless you're working in common Lisp and you've got some, or scheme, and you've got some great macro system, right? But, you know, most of us are stuck with, you know, C++, where you can't really do this. <laughs> it turns out you can make your own functions do this kind of stuff all the time because it is lazy. And so the reality is that any of these operations can be extremely complex to compute, but because the OR operator will never, you know, if the OR operator never selects that option and never returns it, the computation never actually gets done. So that's kind of fun. Here's another common thing we often do, right? So this would have been a series of ifs had we had to write this with null as the key value, as the value indicating that there was no answer. We would have this as a series of ifs. So this is much more concise, right? Okay, here's another thing we do. So here's a set of functions that like get header takes a string and a message and maybe gets a string because there may not be a header. And parse date gets a string and maybe returns you a date because maybe it isn't parsable. And mailbox for date takes a date and maybe we have a mailbox in the user's file system for that date or something. You know, who knows what that function does. But they're all value to maybe. And so what I want to do is I want to pass the values along stopping at any point in the sequence in which I get nothing. So get header for date. If that answer is nothing, we're done. We return a nothing. Otherwise, I need to sort of unwrap the, the just value and pass it to the next function, parse date, which if it succeeds in parsing that header as a date, then I want to unwrap that, maybe, the just, get the date value out and pass that to mailbox. Right? So we would normally write this as a giant cascade of ifs, of nested ifs all the way at the bottom, and the else variant of the whole, either we'd return from the inner part, or worse, if we had to continue to use the value, we'd have to set some value to the default value at the top, or null, and do the lit, you know, it would be some horrible nested thing. And so we have this kind of injection operator, it's pronounced bind, which does that. Now, 
I won't get quite too in there, but this gets a little bit to the question about, like, how does it know how to do FMAP? So it turns out that these functions, these things, these operators, are actually part of type classes, which I'm not going to explain too much, um, but <clears throat> are wonderfully useful. And the answer is that they're highly generic. So it turns out we can use FMAP actually over lists. We can use that alternative thing with lists. We can use it with... We can use bind with things that are monads. Um, these things are highly generic and get used for lots and lots of expand places. Okay. Do we have time for just one more? Yes, we have 11 minutes. So, go! Now, the thing I really love about Haskell, one of the things I really love, it's a strongly typed language. The types really help you encode what you mean to say to your fellow programmers. The types, the compiler will really catch your ass when you forget, like, oops, you didn't cover the empty case. <laughs> you know, it's really nice. But here's the thing I like most about the types in Haskell. You don't actually type them very much. Okay, here is a run length encode function. I will not work through how it works. You can work that out. It's a fun little puzzle. Well, it's not really a puzzle. It's just a fun little piece of code. The only type declarations are on the very first line. It says, if A is a type that knows how to do equality, then given a list of A, I will return a list of pairs of A and an integer, right? This is standard run length encode. Okay, and blah, blah, blah. And now I've got I've, a where lets me introduce like local functions. These are just local functions that I'm only using inside this other function. That's what a where clause is. Um, I've got local variables. I've got this crazy function called next group, which seems to take one, two, three arguments, I think. Um, you know, it's got tests. It's got all this stuff in here. The only types I wrote are up at this top line. And yet... Right? The type of every single thing on the rest of this function has been completely inferred by the compiler, checked, and verified. And I get all that protection for all those things, even though I didn't bother to ever write their types. Right? This is like the, so the, so like the epiphany here was like, wait a minute, it's all the benefits of type checking, or even more benefits of type checking, but I write it like I used to write Python, where I didn't write types anywhere. Like, oh... That's nice. I don't have to write all those things. Now, uh, C++, uh, C++, X11, 0, X11, whatever it's called these days, um, has auto, the auto type, which is somewhat like this, although I don't believe it's quite as powerful or quite as ubiquitous. Um, and, you know, there are languages that we use that sometimes have types or not types or let you have things untyped. This is great. This is types that you get all the type checking, but you don't ever type them. Now, let's compare that to C++. Ready? Whee! <laughs> That's fun. Um, there are a lot of types here. And what bothers me most as a programmer is there are a lot of types that are repeated a lot. Okay, so first off, I have to tell C something that this is generic. Okay, whatever. Then I have to decide list of a pair of Ts and Ns. Okay, that's a lot more wordy than the way you write it in Haskell, but I had to write that in Haskell. And it takes as an argument a list of Ts. I had to write that in As Haskell too. We'll ignore the const and the absurds. Uh, then I had this local variable, and crap, I had to duplicate the frickin' type again, and I had to do that. And then here's the line I really love. I have an iterator, but I like that I have to type type to tell the compiler that the next thing I type is a type. <laughs> right? I mean, this is really bloody awesome. Now, it's true. C++, the new C++ will let you write auto there, and it'll figure it out. Yay, C++ learned something from Haskell or other type inferencing systems. But there's a lot of type stuff you have to write here, and it's pain, and it's gnarly, and it's in the middle of all the damn code, and it annoys me. By the way, just another minor little point. Um, <clears throat> the type system has lots, it lets people do crazy, wonderful things. Um, if you've never encountered a quick check library, I don't know if Haskell was the first quick check library, but I think, who knows? But it's certainly a. Um, here's a bunch of properties about that run length encoding function. I've just simply written them as functions from a given input to Boolean, and I expect these all to be true. Like, um, I expect that the length of the list equals the sum of the second elements of the run length encoded list. Oops, that's right. Uh, sorry, that line's really long, right? I run length encode the list, I take the second elements of all of them, and I sum them, and I expect that to be the length of the original list. That's kind of, you know, a run length encoding invariant. And these are all various invariants that I just wrote. Okay, I would like to actually test this. So I could go to my unit test framework and write, you know, several hundred you know, unit tests, or I could write, well, I probably, what, maybe a dozen tests, unit, you know, test cases for this by hand. But in Haskell, um, because of the type system, I can use a thing called quick check. 
And I can ask QuickCheck just to check this function, and QuickCheck will derive from the type of the function the possible set of inputs that could go there, then generate test cases, and it's relatively smart about generating test cases that actually matter, um, like, you know, like, oh, it's a list. I better try empty list. That's got to be really important. I better try a list of just one item. You know, it gets all the good corner cases. And it generates cases. So this actually allowed me to run 300 test cases on my run length encoding function. Um, you can actually really, honest to God, like pull all this in, type it, and run it. Uh, this is the entire, sorry, that um, plus this plus the loading the module quick check is all it takes to be able to run this. There was no actual additional scaffolding I've left out. Um, so that's actually really sort of fun. OK. So a few other things to point out about the Haskell ecosystem. We've gone through the language a lot, but the ecology of Haskell is actually tremendously nice to work with. Um, GHC, the Glasgow Haskell, comp the glorious Glasgow Haskell compiler, um, is the uh, probably premier standard and the most common used compiler now. Um, it has a command line REPL called GHCI, the interactive version, which is just a delight to use. It's really trivial to load all this code up in there and reload your code. And you can ask it things like, I wrote this code and I didn't write a type signature. Can you tell me what the compiler thinks the type of this code is? Uh, that's actually really common for Haskell programmers to do. I don't want to figure out what it is. You just tell me. Um, Cabal and Hackage. Cabal is a packaging and building subsystem. And Hackage is a very large package repository of now about 3,000 packages. Um, Cabal is the nicest package manager I personally have ever used. It's the only one I know that knows how to install things locally just for you by default. You know, it can do system installs or personal installs. And it, it does all the recursive dependency analysis and download and configure and reinstall all those things. And it's just a joy to use. Um, Haddock is the inline documentation system, which I admit I worked on so um, recently. So, it, But it's nice and it looks cool. Um, Hoogle is astonishing. Do I have three seconds to show you Hoogle? I do. <laughs> OK. Oops, that's not what I want to do. All right. Um, Hoogle, again, the power of types. Hoogle is a search engine for, for code that you've never seen. The, just as, uh, um, let's say I have a function, and I need to go from maybe some value and a list of values, and um, I want to end up with a list of values. Is there a function that does that? Oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> Um, so you can actually, or you can say like, like, or what's a better example? Like I've got a, I've got a string. I'm looking for something that's like, uh, I don't know, you know, what, what manipulates two string? You know, you can actually search by type signature and find all sorts of wonderful functions that you need. It's astonishing how quickly it is to find what you need. Um, and this search is not just what's, this search is like all, all the packages and stuff. So um, Google is very wonderful and great. Mentioning. Um, it is worth noting that I think until very recently, Hash Haskell on Freenode was the largest room <laughs> on IRC. It has typically six to 700 people on it. It's a very friendly community, and it's a really great place to go get your questions answered um, any time of day or night, which is kind of fun. Um, Want to learn more? Uh, go, uh, go Haskell internally. We'll get you um, a bunch of stuff, including some of these links as well. Um, Haskell is actually used here at Google in a few select secret corners. Um, find out more there. Um, what else? Uh, learn you ask. These are some great online tutorials and that stuff. And we're done. Thanks. I have two minutes for questions. <laughs> Um, so he asked, what does it look like when you write Bigtable or some big giant server in it? Is it this pretty? Um, the answer is, uh, 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 yeah, lots of it are. So one of the nice things about Haskell is it's very easy to cleanly separate out parts of your code. It's really good at, I mean, its ability to use modularity and, re and reuse is very, very high. And so often it is really easy to take um, the parts of your code that are gnarly and dealing with the, you know, with the network stack and dealing with, you know, the vagaries of, well, like I've written, I've written backend web servers in Haskell that do standard stuff talking to MySQL. And it's very, very easy to sort of encapsulate because you can do all these really nice high level functions that deal with the IO stuff or deal with the d database stuff. You can stick that on the sign and then have like your logic be nice and your logic and your, your business logic, if you want to call that backend stuff, really clearly separated out. It's also the case that, um, because of the high orderness and the laziness, often in libraries, we have to 
because we don't want the user to actually execute user code if it's not necessary, we often have to bubble control back out to the user. Users of libraries are generally have to do the control operations, high-level control operations. Um, and in Haskell, you can, you can bury all that back down in your library. So the short answer is, yeah, it's a lot nicer. Um, in my experience writing um, the exact same server in, uh, well, big server library in C++, Python, and Haskell, the Haskell code was literally one-third the size. I can give you pointers. That code's open source if you want to actually see the comparison of Pascal. Uh, that's one-third of the C++ size. It's about half the size of the uh, Python. Did I say Pascal? That's not Python. Yes, there was a question over here. Uh, actually, I wanted to know which office has all the people who are attending this talk. Yeah, yeah. Who's, who's the big office is that? New York. Oh, cool. Wow. Hi, New Yorkers. <laughs> 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 Great. Anything else? Do we use this in production? Um, I can answer that question offline. <laughs> Yes, it's in, uh, yeah, our build system has stuff in it. Blaze has support for, for Haskell. Um, what kind of applications do you find are don't like to write in Haskell? Well, I don't like to write uh, uh, client uh, web front end code because I can't get the damn Haskell to run inside <laughs> the browser on the front end. Um, I would in an instant. Um, I, you know, in my mind, Haskell has, over the last couple years, finally traversed into the realm of, like, Yep, it's a good general purpose programming language with enough functionality to do almost any kind of stuff that you need. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm too much of a fan to answer that question. <laughs> My answer is I do everything in Haskell if I can. <laughs> All right, I can stick around. We're officially over and we can stop the recording. Thank you. And uh, I'll stick around if anyone wants to talk or go over finer.